In June 2022, the world witnessed the fourth month of the war in Ukraine. By June, it had become absolutely clear that the Russian invasion had turned into a war of attrition. There were no major breakthroughs, rapid advances or crumbling defences. Russia continued its offensive operations in Donbass, while Ukraine achieved minor gains in the Zaporizhia and Kherson fronts. But on all axes, the war had become a slow-paced affair, where sides grind out for every little town and village for days and weeks, if not months. In June, we continued observing heavy artillery battles, destroyed cities and civilian lives, heavy losses on both sides, and heartbreaking misery caused by this horrible war started by Vladimir Putin. We're at the stage of the war where no end is in sight. Your continued support allows us to expand our work, and we're so grateful for that. We're always eager to create more videos for you, and we think that you'll enjoy our documentaries on post-World War II history over on the Cold War channel, and our Wizards and Warriors channel, which focuses on the fantasy and sci-fi lore battle documentaries. We've also recently started a TikTok channel, and would appreciate your support on that new platform. Consider subscribing to all three, the links are in the description and pinned comment. Thanks for being with us. In the first 10 days of June, hostilities took place on all fronts, though at very different levels of intensity. For instance, on the Zaporizhian front, the line of Oriki Veliki Novosilka remained unchanged, as sides engaged in small-scale battles and artillery duels. There was a stalemate in the Kharkiv front too, as the sides engaged in Subivka, Prudjenka, Kozachalopan, Tanova, Robizhna, Vesela, and Lipsy without any significant territorial change. Earlier in May, Ukraine managed to create a bridgehead over the Savesky Donets in Staryi Seltiv, which was a potential threat to the Russian supply lines connecting Russia with the Izium and Donbass axis. It was reported that in order to prevent this problematic scenario, Russia deployed the 27th Guards Motor Rifle Brigade to this area. On the Kherson front, Ukraine had been trying to break through the Russian defences in two directions. In the first week of June, Heavy fighting took place on the bridgehead created by the Ukrainians over the river in Yelets between Davidiv Brid and Avdrivka. Despite the attempts of the 80th Air Assault Brigade and the 63rd Mechanized Brigade to advance along the T-2207 highway to Novo Kharkova and Kherson, they had been stopped by the Russian 126th Separate Coastal Defense Brigade and the 11th Guards Air Assault Brigade, which reportedly retook Davidiv Brid. The other direction of the Ukrainian offensive in the Kherson Oblast was much closer to the city of Kherson. To the west and northwest of Kherson, the 28th Mechanized Brigade and Marine units attempted to move towards the city along the M14 highway, but the 20th Guards Motor Rifle Division and elements of the Russian Special Forces reported three lines of defensive fortifications erected by the Russians in this direction, preventing this. On July 9th, the Ukrainian Main Intelligence Directorate reported that Russia had been placing old mines transported from the Rostov Oblast of Russia to defend against the Ukrainian counterattack in the area. On June 10th, Russia claimed that it captured the Kinburn Spit in the Ochekiv district of Mykolaiv Oblast. The control over the Kinburn Spit means having the ability to block the Dnipro Bug estuary, which indicates that any vessel leaving the Dnipro River could be stopped by Russia. This move further solidified the Russian control over the northwestern portion of the Black Sea, which allowed them to block crucial grain exports from Ukraine. The military operations were most active around Izium and in Donbass. On June 1st to 6th, the 106th Guards Airborne Division carried out operations to recapture Velika Komoshiveka west of Izium, but the 25th Airborne Brigade repelled them. South of Izium, the 2nd Guards Motor Rifle Division and the 106th Guards Airborne Division did not achieve any meaningful gains in their attempts to bypass defences of Defenka and Berenkova on June 1st to 7th, as the 3rd Tank Brigade and the Right Sector Volunteer Units stopped them. On June 3rd, a Russian military blogger claimed that the situation of Russian units around Izium was extremely difficult. According to him, Due to the incompetence of the Russian command, the 35th Combined Arms Army had almost been destroyed, while the 38th and the 64th Separate Guards Motor Rifle Brigades suffered significant losses and now had less than 100 servicemen in total. 
Russia was more successful around Liman. West of Liman, elements of the 90th Guards Tank Division and the 201st Military Base penetrated the defenses of the 81st Air Assault Brigade and the OUN Battalion, making a breach in the line of Pasika Studinoxos Novoyorova with a target to move south towards Slovyansk. On the 3rd to 8th of June, heavy battles continued south of Liman, where the 15th Separate Motor Rifle Brigade captured Sviatihori National Park, Stari Karevan, and advanced towards Rihorodok, in which the 95th Air Assault Brigade braced for defense. In the south of Donbass, on June 3rd to 6th, Russia continued its very slow progress between Avdivka and New York, where the separatist DPR units pushed the 56th Motorized Brigade and the 1st Air Assault Brigade slightly back north of Avdivka. But in the first 10 days of June, the main theater of war was the area around Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, and Papazna. It was estimated that Russia had around 900 artillery pieces on this front, the bulk of which was used in Severodonetsk, ensuring a significant Russian artillery advantage in this direction. In late May, early June, Russian forces consisting of the Wagner mercenaries redeployed from Papazna, the Chechen National Guard, the 150th Motor Rifle Division, and the separatist LPR units advanced to the city center of Severodonetsk, pushing back the 30th Mechanized Brigade, elements of the 81st Air Assault Brigade, elements of the National Guard, the 111th Territorial Defense Brigade, and international volunteer brigades into the Azot plant and neighborhoods along the Seveski Donets River. The Russian advance was too quick, and they seemingly failed to establish themselves in the center of the city which on June 3rd allowed the Ukrainians to counterattack and retake 20 to 30% of central Severodonetsk, Metolkina, Vyevodivka, Sirotina, and Voronova, inflicting heavy casualties. As the center of the city was difficult to defend, on June 5th, Ukrainian forces retreated to the Azot plant and Russia regained most of these territories. In the area south of Severodonetsk and north of Papazna, the Russian forces continued their attempts to take control of the T-1302 highway to cut the Ukrainian supply line and encircle the Ukrainian defenders in the severodonetsk lysychansk salient. The 90th Guards Tank Division, the 127th Motor Rifle Division, and the separatist LPR militia carried on with their attempts to capture Toshkivka and Herska, but the 24th Mechanized Brigade and the 57th Motorized Brigade managed to withstand the pressure in the first days of June. Russia was more successful in its advance towards Bekhmut, as it made some progress along the MO3 highway, taking Svitlodask and Mirinivsky. In this direction, the Kolchuga Group of Separatist DNR, the 6th MMR of Separatist DPR, and the 40th Separate Naval Infantry Brigade pushed back the 30th Mechanized Brigade. Along with that, the 150th Motor Rifle Division, the 61st Naval Infantry Brigade, and the 100th Separate Motor Rifle Brigade took Borestova, Mikolaivka, and Vrubivka in battles against the 109th and the 118th Territorial Defense Brigades, the 14th Mechanized Brigade, the 17th Tank Brigade, and the 80th Air Assault Brigade. On June 5th, another Russian commander, Major General Roman Kutuzov, was killed near Mikolaivka. He was not the only Russian general to be killed on that day, as Ukraine claimed that the commander of the 29th Combined Arms Army, Lt. Roman Burtnikov, was killed in an unspecified area. There were also several notable events related to the war in Ukraine in the first 10 days of June, but did not happen on the battlefield. The month of June started with the United States agreeing to send the M142 High Mobility Artillery Rocket System, HIMARS, which Ukraine had been asking for for a while. Military analysts attribute the Ukrainian setbacks around Severodonetsk in late May to a significant artillery advantage of Russia in this area. Ukraine hoped to offset this by getting powerful artillery systems like HIMARS, which has a range of up to 80 kilometers. After receiving assurances of not using HIMARS against targets in Russia, the United States finally agreed to provide this artillery system to Ukraine. On June 4th, Vladimir Putin reacted to the supply of HIMARS by the United States to Ukraine, stating that this would not change anything and that the Russian forces were cracking the Western weapons supplied to Ukraine like nuts. On June 5th, for the first time in over a month, Russia fired a missile on the capital, Kyiv. 
Five X-22 cruise missiles were fired from Tu-95 aircraft from the direction of the Caspian Sea and hit the Donizia rail car repair plant. Russia claimed that it targeted T-72 tanks supplied to Ukraine by European countries, but it is impossible to verify if that was the case. On June 9th, yet another attack took place on a military commissariat in Russia. This time, perpetrators threw a Molotov cocktail on the conscript office in Vladivostok, which became at least the 18th such incident in Russia since the start of the war. But while the Ukrainian army was still powerful enough to contain the Russians in the majority of the axes, its setbacks in Severodonetsk and the rest of the Donbass front once again demonstrated the advantage in firepower Russia possessed. On June 10th, the deputy head of the Ukrainian main intelligence directorate, Vadim Skibitsky, claimed that Ukraine was using 5,000 to 6,000 rounds of artillery ammunition daily to counter Russian artillery attacks, but as a result, the Ukrainian army had nearly exhausted its supplies. He claimed that Russia had a 1 to 10 to 15 advantage in artillery pieces on the battlefield. We cannot know whether that is true, or if the Ukrainian government used this rhetoric to push the West to deliver more weapons and do it faster. But the situation in Severodonetsk was a good indicator of the Ukrainian disadvantage in artillery battles. Also on June 10th, Putin spoke about Peter the Great, saying that the Russian Tsar was taking back and reinforcing what belonged to Russia, and it looks like it fell on us to take back and reinforce as well. This is just another quote demonstrating Putin's dismissive attitude towards the sovereignty of countries that were once part of the Russian Empire. On the 11th to 27th of June, territorial gains and losses were reported on both sides. While the situation near the Davidiv Brid bridgehead remained stable, Ukraine gained territory in other directions on the Kherson front. Northwest of the city of Kherson, the Ukrainian 28th Mechanized Brigade and the 137th Marine Corps penetrated the first line of the Russian defenses in some places, most importantly between Blahadetna and Kisilivka. The area remained contested as the 20th Guards Motor Rifle Division maintained the defense of the fortified lines. Northeast of Kherson, the 63rd Mechanized Brigade pushed back the 205th Separate Motor Rifle Brigade and liberated Vysokopilya and Olina. The Russian attempt to counterattack on June 25th was repelled. Also northeast of Kherson, the 60th Mechanized Brigade moved along the west bank of the Dnipro and liberated Novovorontsovka and Osokorivka, driving the 34th Separate Motor Rifle Brigade to Zoltobelka. On the Kharkiv front, Russia managed to achieve several gains. On June the 11th to 17th, the 107th and the 437th Motor Rifle Regiments continued putting pressure on Sapivka, Veliki Prokhodi, and Dementivka. It was reported that the area is heavily contested, and the Ukrainian 72nd Mechanized Brigade and the 113th Territorial Defense Brigade try to maintain control over these towns. The 25th Separate Guards Motor Rifle Brigade and the DPR militia managed to take control of significant portions of Tenova and Vasila as the 92nd Mechanized Brigade remained under pressure. Elsewhere, the 138th Separate Guards Motor Rifle Brigade made some gains in Rabizhna against the 127th Territorial Defense Brigade and the Ukrainian Special Forces units. It was also reported that several units on both sides had been redeployed to the Izium and Donbass fronts. West of Izium, on the 14th to 20th of June, the 93rd Mechanized Brigade and elements of the 95th Air Assault Brigade made some progress between Ivanivka and the P-79 Highway, pushing back the 39th Separate Guards Motor Rifle Brigade and the 106th Guards Airborne Division. There were exaggerated reports of the Ukrainian advance reaching an area 5 kilometers away from Izium in this direction, but it has not been confirmed. The Ukrainian forces, namely the 3rd Tank Brigade and the Right Sector Volunteer Corps, also liberated the town of Dmitrivka, expelling the 69th Separate Covering Brigade from there. South of Izium, Russia finally captured the village of Tefenka after months of fighting. The 36th Separate Guards Motor Rifle Brigade and the 12th Guards Tank Regiment drove the 81st Air Assault Brigade out of Tefenka, while the 3rd Motor Rifle Division and the 90th Guards Tanks Division made small gains along the Karulka-Yarova line on June 11th to 24th. 
In the same period, the attempts of the 74th Separate Guards Motor Rifle Brigade and the 15th Separate Motor Rifle Brigade to drive towards Slavyansk was stopped by the 95th Air Assault Brigade in Rajhorodok, bolstered by solid fortifications in the area. The Ukrainian situation in the severodonetsk lysychansk salient worsened in the period of June 11th to 24th. The Russian artillery advantage, which the Ukrainian commander-in-chief Valery Zalushny described as tenfold, proved very difficult for the Ukrainians to compensate for. On June 13th, the governor of Luhansk stated that the remaining three bridges connecting Severodonetsk to the rest of the Ukrainian-controlled territory were destroyed, which exacerbated the already difficult supply problem for Ukraine. On June 20th, Mytolkina was recaptured by Russia. On June 22nd, the 127th Motor Rifle Division and the separatist LPR militia pushed the Ukrainian Donbass Battalion and International Volunteer Brigades out of Toshkivka, Mirnodolina, and Pitlisna. On June 23rd, the Russian 127th Motor Rifle Division, the 100th Separate Motor Rifle Brigade, and the Chechen National Guard finally managed to capture the 24th Mechanized Brigade in a double envelopment in the Hiska Zolota area, leaving it no other option but to withdraw from there. The Russian media claimed that the Ukrainian forces in the area surrendered, but it has not been confirmed since then, and the 24th Mechanized Brigade most likely managed to withdraw to Lysychansk. Finally, on June 24th, Severodonetsk, the target of the Russian offensive since mid-April, fell, after the withdrawal of the Ukrainian units from there, due to the defensive operations becoming extremely costly. This retreat made the defense of Lysychansk extremely difficult, as the city was now surrounded from three sides. On June 19th to 24th, finally, after a long stalemate, Ukraine managed a modest advance of close to 10 kilometers south of Vulida, as the 54th Mechanized Brigade liberated Yehorivka, Yevhenivka, and Petrivska in battles against the 150th Motor Rifle Division and the 136th Guards Motor Rifle Brigade. It is yet to be seen whether Ukraine has enough forces to turn this progress into something meaningful, or if it was just a one-off event and a stalemate on this front will continue. Let's examine some of the important events which happened off the battlefield in this period. On June 11th, it was reported that the first Russian passports were presented to people in Kherson and Zaporizhia oblasts. Such reports indicate that Russia plans to stay in these regions for a long time. On June 14th, Russia and the separatist DPR accused Ukraine of shelling Donetsk, which killed five civilians. Ukraine denied responsibility for this. On June 15th, the US President, Joe Biden, pledged a further $1 billion worth of military aid. Other NATO members also stated that they would provide Ukraine with additional weapons. On the following day, the leaders of Germany, France, Italy and Romania visited Kyiv and held talks with the Ukrainian President Zelensky. Along with other aims, this visit served the purpose to deny the reports of France and Germany appeasing Putin and encouraging Ukraine to agree to Russian demands. These claims were denied, and the French President Macron stated that these countries are doing everything so that Ukraine alone can decide its fate. They also pledged additional weapons and financial and humanitarian support, along with backing Ukrainian membership in the EU. On June 17th, Ukrainian sources claimed that the commander of the Russian Airborne Forces, VDV, Colonel General Andrei Surjikov, was dismissed for poor performance and many casualties. It was reported that the Chief of Staff of the Central Military District, Colonel General Mikhail Teplinsky, was appointed instead. On June 19th, the Russian Senator Konstantin Kozachev reported about the blockade of the Russian exclave of Kaliningrad by Lithuania. He accused Lithuania of preventing the import of certain goods to Kaliningrad. In June, Lithuania banned the transit of steel and other ferrous metals in line with the EU sanctions against Russia. The Kremlin responded with condemnation and threats to act against this. This would have meant a potential conflict between the NATO member state Lithuania and Russia. In an effort to de-escalate the situation, on June 23rd, the EU High Commissioner Josip Borrell stated that the European Union had no intention to block lawful transport of goods from mainland Russia to Kaliningrad, 
and implied that the EU was seeking ways to prevent circumvention of the sanctions and not to block the traffic. On June 22nd, reports of the former Ukrainian MP Alexei Kovalev, who defected to Russia, dying in a blast emerged. On June 30th, he spoke from a hospital, and it is clear that he is alive, but this was yet another indicator of the Ukrainian sabotage activities in Russian-held territories. Also on this day, Russia and Turkey agreed to pursue negotiations on the transit of Ukrainian grain to international markets. The Russian blockade of the Ukrainian ports prevented globally crucial grain exports up to that point, as many international experts warned of potentially disastrous consequences of this in the world, particularly in poor countries. At the time when this script was being written, there had been no new reports on this, but we can just hope that there will be a way for this issue to be solved. On the following day, after months of uncertainty and rumours, the European Union officially granted Ukraine the status of a candidate for a session. While it may take years for Ukraine to become an EU member, it was an undoubtedly positive development for Ukraine on a diplomatic front. On June 23rd, Ukrainian leadership announced the arrival of the highly expected HIMARS systems, and it seemingly started playing a role in the war immediately, as over the last 10 days of the month, the Ukrainians managed to destroy over 10 Russian ammunition depots, prompting a number of Russian bloggers to claim that this will create a number of problems in terms of logistics. The Russian side presented only one set of remains of a HIMARS missile, and some of the depots hit were within range of the non-reactive artillery systems, so it is difficult to say if every such attack was conducted by the HIMARS, but it is clear that Ukraine is trying to hit as many logistics hubs of the Russian army as possible in order to create an ammunition shortage for the enemy artillery. Indeed, on the 26th of June, media reported that Belarus sent up to 20 wagons of artillery shells to Russia. It is obvious that Russia has enough ammunition elsewhere, but the transportation from Belarus was quicker, so we can deduce that Russia needed ammunition as soon as possible. It also adds a wrinkle to the talks about possible Belarusian involvement in the war as Lukashenko keeps at least seven BTGs along the border with Ukraine, but it is nowhere near enough to cause serious problems for Ukraine in the northwest. On June 24th, the Russian media reported another two attempts to burn conscript offices in Belgorod and Perm. Also on that day, for the first time since the start of the Russian invasion, the Russian MOD officially revealed the military commanders assigned to the campaign in Ukraine. Colonel General Alexander Lapin was the commander of the Central Military District, which was responsible for operations in Severodonetsk and Lysychansk. Army General Sergei Savorokin commanded the Southern Group and was in charge of the operations in Hiska and Solota. While no information was given about the overall commander of the Russian forces in Ukraine, British intelligence claimed that Alexander Dvonikov was dismissed from his position and the fact that the director of Russia's military political directorate, Colonel General Gennady Zhidko, accompanied the Russian defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, in his inspection of Russian forces in Ukraine on June 26, indicates that he became the new commander. On June 25th, the Ukrainian command reported that Russia fired over 50 missiles on Kyiv, Zhotomir, Chenihiv, Lviv, Mykolaiv, Kharkiv, Dnipropetrovsk, and Kalmanitsky oblasts. They claimed that the Ukrainian air defense managed to shoot down most of the missiles. On the following day, Russia made a massive missile strike on Kyiv from its Tu-95 and Tu-160 bombers over the Caspian Sea. On June 27th, yet another brutal missile attack on civilian infrastructure was carried out by Russia at a shopping center in Kremenchuk, which killed scores of civilians. Russia claimed that the shopping center was used as storage for Western-supplied weapons but provided no proof for that. It is important to mention that Russia continues using unguided KH-22 missiles in these strikes. Initially conceived as an anti-ship missile to be used with a nuclear warhead, this missile didn't need to be very precise, but its 500 meters or so error range makes it difficult to use in urban areas. On June 28th, it was reported that Ukraine continued its slow advance on the Kherson front. The Ukrainian marine units liberated Zelenyi High on the eastern bank of the river Inhilets, while the 28th Mechanized Brigade liberated Bavinok, northwest of the city of Kherson. But Ukraine's situation in Donbass continues to deteriorate. 
On June 28 to 29, the Russian Separate Motor Rifle Brigade reportedly crossed the Savisky Donetsk River from Kremina and captured Pravilia. Other Russian and Separatist LPR forces occupied the Lysychansk oil refinery. According to the reports emerging from Russia, the remaining Ukrainian forces in Lysychansk and its vicinity started a full withdrawal towards Savisk, Kramatorsk, and Slovyansk. On the last day of June, Russian forces retreated from the Zminyi island. Russia occupied this island on the first day of the war, but it had been under a heavy Ukrainian bombardment, which finally forced the Russian units on the island to withdraw. While the Russian Defense Ministry described this step as a sign of goodwill, it is beyond doubt that the cost of the occupation of Zminyi island outweighed the benefit of having it, which forced the Russian command to make this decision. One of the reasons why Russia left the island was the fact that Ukraine, armed with Harpoon anti-ship missiles, was now able to effectively destroy Russian vessels in the area, making the supply of the island difficult. For instance, on the 17th, Russian tug Spastil Vasilybek was destroyed while carrying personnel, weapons and ammunition to resupply the island. Nevertheless, this withdrawal is not going to solve the blockade of the Ukrainian ports in the northwestern sector of the Black Sea, since Russian anti-ship systems in Crimea and the Kherson Oblast could still target Ukrainian vessels in this area. At the same time, Ukraine also targeted the gas rigs in the western Black Sea area, setting at least one of them on fire. These rigs were stolen by Russia in 2014, during the annexation of Crimea. Between the 28th and 30th, NATO countries and allies met in Madrid for a summit, which resulted in two major developments. After negotiations, Turkey signed a memorandum with Sweden and Finland, as both countries agreed to a number of Turkish stipulations. As a result, Turkey dropped its opposition to the accession of these Nordic countries to NATO, and they received a formal invitation to join the alliance. Putin, who previously threatened both countries in case they joined NATO, and claimed that his invasion of Ukraine is due to the expansion of the alliance, was less aggressive, stating, with Sweden and Finland, we don't have the problems that we have with Ukraine. They want to join NATO? Go ahead. This Nordic expansion of NATO is something Russia tried to avoid for many decades, but with his army bogged down in Ukraine, Putin doesn't have the leverage to do anything about it. At the same time, NATO countries and allies announced another round of military and financial support to Ukraine, with the US President Biden pledging about 140,000 anti-tank systems, more than 600 tanks, almost 500 artillery systems, more than 600,000 shells, advanced MLRS anti-ship systems, and air defense. It is curious what he meant by 600 tanks. We know that the Soviet-era tanks that the Warsaw Pact countries used have almost all been sent to Ukraine already, so it is possible that by tanks Biden meant armored vehicles. A more interesting detail is the air defense systems. It is now known that the US will buy NASEMs from Norway for Ukraine. This anti-air defense system is one of the most modern in the world and can serve to limit Russian air power even more. In the fourth month of the war in Ukraine, Russia continued its slow advance in Donbass, while also solidifying its defensive positions in the Kharkiv Oblast. Despite making strides against the positions of the Ukrainian forces fortified since 2014, the Russians only managed to further take just 0.3% of the Ukrainians' territory. The Russian breakthrough on the Hesker Zolota front failed to surround a significant number of Ukrainian forces. Meanwhile, Ukraine has assigned a significant part of its troops to Donbass to prevent a rapid Russian breakthrough. And it looks like the Ukrainian command had identified the Kherson front as the main direction of its counteroffensive operations. Nevertheless, their advance on this front is slow too, just like its small amount of progress on the Zaporizhian front. During this period, Russia enjoyed a significant firepower advantage in Donbass, and has been compensating for its poor planning and abysmal communication among different branches of the military by concentrating large groups of forces in small areas and simply overpowering the Ukrainian defenders. Despite weapon supplies from the West, Ukraine just does not possess the resources to ensure firepower parity in all directions. Further complicating the matters for Ukraine are the reports about the decrease in the effectiveness of Ukrainian drones. 
According to the report of foreign policy's Jack Detch, Russia has improved its air defense capabilities against drones, limiting the use of Turkish TB2 drones and the American Grey Eagle drones. Both sides continued to suffer heavy casualties in this war of attrition. According to the Ukrainian government's report of June 3rd, Ukraine has suffered at least 10,000 killed and 30,000 wounded since the start of the war. The US estimate of the Russian casualties has been at 16,000 KIA by June 15th, while the UK estimates claimed 20,000 KIA by the same date. On June 23rd, the separatist DPR authorities reported 2,183 killed and 9,169 wounded since the start of the war. The Oryx military blog indicated the following numbers of visually confirmed losses of military equipment on both sides. Russian losses were 808 tanks, 1,631 military and transportation vehicles, 87 command posts and communication stations, 14 heavy mortars, 200 pieces of artillery, 85 multiple rocket launchers, 35 military aircraft, 49 helicopters, and 91 drones. Ukraine's losses were 200 tanks, 415 military and transportation vehicles, 3 command posts and communication stations, 77 pieces of artillery, 19 multiple rocket launchers, 29 military aircraft, 11 helicopters, and 25 drones. Unfortunately, the war continues, and so our series will continue too. If you don't want to miss any of the episodes, make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.